Cadillac Unscripted on 107.9 CDY is sponsored by Independent Bank. My co-host is Katie Huckle, as always. And Katie, this is going to be kind of a special show for me because this is a fella who went to high school at the same time as I did at Alpena. Mm-hmm. We're both Alpena guys. Yep. Graduated a year apart. I've worked here in Cadillac for 16 years. You've worked here in Cadillac for how long? 25. And Incredible. we've never met. Incredible. Never met. We so. have Trooper Rick Pearson with us this morning. Um, so many years with the Michigan State Police. Thank you so much for your service. Oh, thank you. Congratulations Thanks for having me. On, and congratulations on your well-deserved retirement, Rick. Oh, I appreciate that. I got, I got to tell you, when I pulled into the studio this morning and saw you standing in the parking lot, I thought, okay, do I have my seatbelt on? Was I speeding? <laughs> How does my makeup look? No. The exact same thing coming around the corner. You better not be driving too fast. Uh-huh. Yeah, well. and, and, and here you're such a laid-back guy. Yeah, and I am, but I do the same thing. If a trooper's following me and I'm off duty, I kind of get a little nervous, too. I think uh, it's just part of the uh, the heritage of the Michigan State Police. You know, right. we've, we're going to treat you fairly, but, you know, if you're doing something wrong, we might have to take action. So, Well, and, and you're keeping us safe. I mean, that's the point of the whole thing. Correct. Um, so tell us a little bit about your career start to finish. You, you graduate from Alpena High, and then what happens? Well, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, and it's kind of ironic because I was questioned in a crime. I was working for my aunt at her gas station, and some money got taken. Oh, boy. So, since I was working one of the shifts that the money was taken, Mm -hmm. I got questioned about it. You were a suspect. I was a suspect, and the state police come in and asked me to take a lie detector test. No. And I'd already started thinking about corrections, because my brother worked in the state corrections system. And so I was kind of thinking about going that route, but from Alpena to the lab, the state police lab in Grayling to take the polygraph test, I got talking with the trooper, finding out the process, and from that point on, I started trying to become a trooper. Isn't that amazing? That's an incredible story. What a great, what an interesting way to start a career. And I passed the polygraph, too. I I was going to say, who did it? Who took the money? I, we don't know. Incredible. Yep. They never did actually solve that one. Um, I'm sure it was probably one of the other employees, but we'll never know. Right. But then to make things even more ironic, when I got to Cadillac, my first sergeant was the person that gave me the lie detector test 29 <laughs> years before that. He did not remember. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, he ended up being my field training officer um, sergeant. When I got to Cadillac, so okay, that's a god thing. It has to be, Rick. Yeah, it has to be because this is the same man that sort of, you know, got you introduced to the concept of of law enforcement that way. Right, and helped me, you know, see that it's a profession. And even though I was scared of them, they treated me fairly. Mm -hmm. I think they probably thought I stole the money. That's why they had me do the polygraph test. And but they were still nice to me. And you know, when I passed it, they said, "Well, you know." We didn't think you were going to pass it. We thought you were our person, but you're not. And it just kind of showed me that I could do that in my career, too. So you graduated in 1989, and you're telling me that all those years through high school, at Alpena High School, you really didn't have an idea of what you were going to do. No, not at all. I was was, was going into sports. Um, Okay. Yeah, I went to CMU on a baseball scholarship, and I thought that was going to be my life. It just... I wasn't mature enough to go to a four-year college. Mm-hmm. I wasn't. I came from a family where my dad was very strict, and then he passed away about that same year, and then I was really lost. I didn't know what I was going to do. Mm-hmm. Okay. What position did you play on the baseball team? Uh, third base. Oh, boy. Do you still yeah. play baseball? No, I don't, which okay. is kind of ironic because it was such a big part of my life. Oh, but... absolutely. Kind of your identity. You were a standout right. and you were a star. Yeah. It's Division One baseball, isn't it? Correct. Incredible. So wow. when, you, when you look back on your years at Alpena High School, do you have any coaches or teachers that you uh, look up to and remember? Yes. Mike Catarat was one of our one of my baseball coaches. And I my still, cousin. My it, cousin. Your cousin? Okay. Oh, my gosh. The <laughs> yes. world is so small. <laughs> he Crazy. Has, he has continued to follow me throughout my career, and he's kept in touch with me, which I found amazing. I'm he's gonna, probably very I proud. I am going to share the audio of this show with him. Oh, he will way. faint. Oh, he will. Yes, absolutely. Well, cousin and, Mike. And, and, and when, you, when you're when you working with youth like that and you see someone succeed and you know that you were part of their path, you know, that's fulfilling for people. We know teachers and coaches don't get paid enough. Exactly. So what's the reward? And, and Rich can tell us this because of his other job. Um, it, the reward is watching your students succeed. 
Absolutely. So do you have uh, that kind of mentor relationship with some of your younger troopers where you put in charge of, you know, uh, 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 just kind of taking them under your wing? Yeah, I see where you're getting at. I was fortunate enough that with having a little bit of prior experience when I got in the department, they made me a field training officer almost right away. Mm -hmm. So I've been training troopers out of the academy for almost the whole 25 years. And it was kind of uh, bittersweet. About two weeks ago, I walked in the squad room and I realized, hmm, I've been a cop longer than any of these guys have been alive. (laughs) All the troopers in the afternoon shift were, you know, I've got almost 30 years experience and they were younger than 30 years old. So, yeah, I'm kind of the grandpa there. Not not (laughs) always easy to walk into a workplace like with me in a classroom full of 16 and 17 year olds to have those reminders of how old you are every day. Our own mortality, right? exactly. And yeah. we feel so young. Yeah. Well, and we all look so young. Uh, you do. <laughs> no. And it happened so quick. Right. I, everybody kept telling me, your career's going to go by fast. Take notes. Try to remember things. I wish I would have taken better notes because there's so many things I've been reminiscing about in the last couple of months. Sure. I'm like, boy, I forgot all about that, you know, or some of the other troopers. Or I visited some of the retired troopers that trained me, and they brought stories up. So it's been a good last month You, here. you could write a book. I know you could. Yeah. Um, question for you. When, when some of these young folks approach you and, and say, Rick, you know, I've been thinking about law enforcement, what do you tell those people? I'm pretty honest with them. Because I'll put it right back at them and say, why do you want to be in law enforcement? And most of them are going to tell me because they want to help people. And I'll tell them straight up, most days you're not helping people. You're writing them citations. You're taking them to jail. You're meeting them on their worst day. So when we're out patrolling and the dispatch center calls, they're giving us what's called a complaint. So every time you get sent to something, somebody's making a complaint. So I just try to make sure that they understand that, you're not always out there changing somebody's tire or getting the handshake. It's the, I mean, the most responsible anybody, most, I guess it's hard for me to say this. Um, it's the most responsibility a person can have in government, taking somebody else's freedom away from them or mm-hmm. their life legally. I mean, that's a pretty, pretty high standard for people to have to carry the badge and walk around with. So when I have the younger children, I shouldn't say children, but, you know, younger adults in their 20s because I do background investigations for the department, too. So if somebody's applied and they've passed the written test and a few other things, they'll get to me and I do their background investigation. And I make sure they know that they have to, you know, sleep at night. And it's hard to do that sometimes when you have to take somebody away from their house and their family when you have to arrest them. Oh, my God. I can't imagine. Is um, is PTSD a real thing amongst amongst law enforcement in if, your in your line? If you would have asked me five years ago, I would have said no. I didn't okay. believe in it, but it's caught up to me for sure. And, and is the, is it because of things that have just happened in the last five years or memories of things that happened earlier in your career that brought that forward? It's For me, it's a combination of things. Uh-huh. Like I can remember, it wasn't even two miles from here, one of the first major accidents I went to, a gentleman came up to me with a blanket and it was a baby, didn't have a head because mm. it came out of the car. Mm-hmm. And that... Yeah. Man, was he was an off-duty deputy, and he didn't even know what to do other than to hand me this child. So you have that oh, constantly gosh. hitting you. Mm-hmm. But the profession has gotten a lot better because we'll talk about it. You know, it's open now. When I got in the department, you didn't tell anybody you were having bad feelings or bad dreams. It wasn't mm-hmm. what you did. Mm-hmm. So you didn't have the support system. But now the other troopers will talk to you. Um, we have, you know, behavioral science doctors in the department that we can talk to, and nobody's afraid to talk to them. Excellent. We have a chaplain um, service throughout the department, and they'll do ride-alongs. And you're not, you know, I used to uh, ride along with the first chaplain we had all the time, and everybody's like, what's wrong with Trooper Pearson? Well, I liked the guy, and he liked me, and we liked riding together. Sure. But everybody thought I had something going on because the chaplain was with me all the time. Oh, okay. So it's good that that stigma's kind of gone away. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that because... You guys need support. Do you think, uh, Trooper Pearson, that overall the general public supports police better now than they used to? Or do you think it's the opposite? I think it's the opposite, but I think being in northern Michigan, I've had it pretty good. Mm-hmm. And, and You're I'll be kind, honest, of, kind of isolated from it. Yeah, there's nice people here. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm not going to lie, probably five, six times a year somebody gives me the one-finger salute. Just oh, being in a patrol no. car. Oh, no. But at the same time, 
the few times that I'll go through the drive through to eat dinner, I can't remember the last time that the person in front of me didn't pay for my dinner. Right. Oh, so, I mean, wow. that's awesome. That's too. wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so if someone says, OK, you know, I, I want a career in law enforcement, you'll say to them, you're going to make a good living, but you're not going to get rich. No, you won't get rich, mm -hmm. but you're helping the community. And for me, helping somebody when I do get to help somebody, that's what makes it worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So that's like for us in retirement, my wife and I, we're going to travel the country and donate our money and donate our time to help veterans. And so we have a plan. We're going to try to hit every state so we can check off each state and say that we donated something there. Or we did some volunteerism there and go on to the next state. How many oh, have you been to wonderful. so far? How many have you been to so far? We just came up with this idea a month ago, and um, I donated some money to Silent Observer here in Cadillac not okay. too long ago. So that was our first one to start the retirement here. But so yeah, we're still we're going to get the truck and travel trailer, and we've been planning on doing this for a long time and travel the country. Obviously, I'm going to have some fun too and see Good. some family and awesome. <laughs> do you've got, it, you've got like, your but, bucket list. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh man, doesn't he deserve it? Yeah, it's you certainly do. Yeah, that's awesome. So one thing I did want to ask you, uh, Rick, is um, maybe look back on your best day in law enforcement in the last 30 plus years and maybe the one that was the hardest on you. Well, he just announced and his I, retirement. That's a good thing. Yeah, day. that's always a good thing. I'm announcing <laughs> my retirement. Yeah, so, and and by the way, when this show is heard, which will be on Saturday morning, you will be approximately, two, you'll be just two days from your official retirement. Correct. Although you told us before you we started today that you're, you're kind of pretty much done already, right? You right, just got a yeah. few things left? Yeah, I have to go down to Lansing tomorrow, and they take all my equipment back and guns and account for everything. So that's pretty much a full day. And then just how it worked out somehow, I've got to work three hours on Sunday. Okay. So it, it'll be an administrative, I'll be washing patrol cars like I did when I started probably and cleaning out the posts a little bit, but putting those three hours in. So yeah, I'm um, pretty much done. Is there a ceremony for retiring state troopers? Not normally. It's up to the trooper themselves. So I am actually retiring with another trooper that had four years more than me, Trooper Rickliffs. And so um, Friday, this Friday, we're having a little get together with some coffee and cake and the retires, retirees will be there and uh, a couple of legislators are going to be there and present us with some awards. So I'm excited about that. Oh, that's just awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think to answer your question, the best day was probably actually joining the department and getting my badge that first day because it was so hard to get to. Well, and you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because that was going to be my next question. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the rigors of trooper school and how tough it is to become part of, of that elite group. When I took the written test for my recruit school, there was over 6,500 people that took the written test. And there was 96 of us that got badges at the end of the process. So you take the written test, you pass that, then you move along to um, the physical fitness test. So you pass that, and then you go to a background investigation that usually lasts two to three months. Um, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. They look at everything. If there's any, any uh, hinkling of any felony behavior of any kind, whether you're guilty of it or not you're immediately booted out of the system for life it's right. a very strict process mm -hmm. and then there's a medical exam um drug testing and then uh, appointment to the academy and I, I thought about this my whole career if they told me i had to go back for the whole thing i don't know i might have had to do something else because it's tough you get up at five o'clock in the morning um it's a paramilitary style academy you're doing the push-ups the sit-ups the throw-ups the, every day you're oh just, my gosh and you're standing in line um it, so but it's also throwing a bachelor's degree into 16 weeks because they got to get all that stuff they're paying you and training you i wasn't aware you that of that stuff. yeah i didn't know that wow so, i didn't know yeah. it was the equivalent yes and so our academy's now last a little bit longer because, you know, with time, there's more paperwork and things have changed. Everybody's got tasers now. You know, there's different weapons. So the, the academy lasts a little bit longer than it did when I went through. Um, but still, I'm so proud when I see the young troopers come to the post the first time because I know they're getting great training. And, you know, like we say, we, 
minorities, females, we don't care. If you can sit in the car next to us and do the job, we don't care who you are, right? Mm -hmm. That's the thing. And mm -hmm. the citizen, we shouldn't either. Right. So, you, you're on a mission. Yeah. We're just out there to do what we can to make our citizens safe and our public safe. Is there anything that has happened technologically in the last five or ten years that you would have never seen 20 to 25 to 30 years ago when you first got into a car? Yes. And the funny thing that we don't have is I thought we were going to have jetpacks by now. I really did. <laughs> The Jetsons. Yes. I love it. I, I want thought a jet pack, right? I'd be patrolling with a jetpack by now, but no. So, um, I mean, I know you're, but, you're, you're riding around with, I mean, you've, you've got a laptop in front of you. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have, you have so many distractions. Oh, my. But the kind of distractions that you and I, Katie, are not supposed to have exactly. when we're driving around, but at high rate of speed. Yeah, exactly. Let's add that. Yeah. I would say, Probably the thing that's shocked me the most is being able to take somebody's picture and getting back within a couple of minutes who they are possibly. Mm -hmm. Or we even have um, fingerprint scanners now where I could walk up to you. If you don't have your driver's license and I stopped you, I can do a fingerprint scanner on the side of the road and it'll come back and tell me who you are and if you're wanted. Um, you know, you got to remember 30 years ago when I started, I jump in a car, I had a clipboard, I threw a shotgun in the back seat. And we had a shovel in the trunk, and that was pretty much it. And chasing after Bo and Luke Duke. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. So in my, in my business, the mortgage business, we are required to register fingerprints um, with the government. Uh, mm -hmm. you know. And so when I had to get printed, I had to come to the post. And I'm telling you, my hands were sweating, and I was shaking. I'm like, I'm just here to get fingerprinted. And I knew that nothing was going to pop up. But to me, there's something formidable. And there's something intimidating. It's supposed to be, though, isn't it? I don't know. Is it, Rick? I think so, a little okay. bit. Um, and to brag a little bit, I did get um, what's called the Corporal Mapes Award three times in my career. And that's the person at the work site that made the most felony arrests. And so what we're talking about here is what I use because... You could talk to me like we are right now and be nervous inside, and I'm going to pick up on it because your neck muscle or your neck is going to start beating really hard because you're nervous, right. right? You can't control that. And there's I other see. things that I'll see on a traffic stop that I'll notice that isn't normal. You know, like make a thousand traffic stops in a year with every different kinds of people. Sure. When I start seeing these certain signs, that's when I start looking a little bit further into it. So mm -hmm. we use that intimidation factor to our benefit mm -hmm. in that way, mm -hmm. but. Nobody should be that intimidated that they can't come up and talk to us at any right. time. Exactly, right. exactly. <clears throat> and it, it is. You're, you're serving the community. Um, if we could sit your mom and dad down, what would they tell us about your career and, and their feelings about their son, Rick? I think my mom would say that I drove around a pretty blue car and shook people's hands. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't tell her what was going on. Right. And, yeah. the, you know, my brother worked in the state prison system. And ended up getting hurt to the point where I had to take a retirement. He got stabbed in the head and the chest and oh. his knee got. So anyways, he ended up having to take a retirement. So my mom just thought she did, if she didn't know, she didn't have to worry. Sure. And, you know, my dad, I think you'd be pretty proud of me. Um, I was just telling some of the younger troopers the other day, we had our hunting camp and broken into one time. And my mom went into town and had the state troopers come out. And my dad worked it out with the state troopers that the guy because the guy was there he was intoxicated and he spent the night in our hunting cabin and so my dad held him while the troopers got there well my dad worked it out so that the guy could work for my dad because my dad owned an engineering company and so after a month the guy had worked enough to pay off the damage he did and i still remember the gentleman worked for my dad for another three years after that and i just remember the whole dynamic of the troopers being there and my dad's, you know, always telling me how much he respected the troopers and how they helped him work this out. And this was, you know, 40 years ago now, so it's not going to happen in this day and age, but it right. did back then up in Alpena, right? So seeing how he was not necessarily infatuated, but I could just tell he had a lot of respect for the troopers. So mm -hmm. I'm sure he's proud of me. Problem solving. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and reconciling, you know, what he did. And then he, that man must have respected your father to stay on after he repaid oh, yeah. him. Yeah, definitely. Uh-huh. So when we talk about retirement, I mean, your days have been very full. And so I know you're going to be doing some traveling, but what are you most looking forward to when the day comes that you don't have to roll out of bed and go to work? I think getting back to that normal mindset of just being a citizen, 
Yes. Where I'm not like looking into every car or um, my, my wife just retired last year. She was an emergency 911 dispatcher. So she had more stress than me. Right. Um, and I like to say I was glad she retired because she used to tell me what to do and where to go at work <laughs> and at home. So. <laughs> I think I love this woman. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and we've talked about it and it's just, it's a different lifestyle. You know, a month ago she texted me, are you coming home for dinner? I said, no, I'm en route to a man with a gunshot wound to his head. Okay. See you later. And I got thinking about that. Oh. That's just not a normal like conversation that spouses are supposed to have with each other, but that's been my life for the last 30 years. You know, I'm not going to be able to make it. I got to go to this. She knows as long as my post commander or somebody's not coming to the house and I'm safe. And that's just kind of how we've kind of dealt with things. So I'm, I'll be glad that she's not having to go through that. Yes. And that I can just maybe relax a little bit. Because even off duty as a state trooper, we've got to take action if we see something anywhere I, in the state. Okay. You know, and we always have to carry a gun with us. And so it's just I'm ready to be done with that part of it. I'll bet. That makes me feel safer, though, knowing that I didn't realize that, that you had to take action. That does make me feel safer. Well, yeah, and not only that, but I think about the the uh, law enforcement spouse who wakes up every morning and says goodbye to you. You walk out the door, and yeah. they literally don't know no. what you're going to see that day mm-hmm. and if you're going to come back or if you're going to get hurt or anything like that. You know? And that's one of the first things when I have a new trainee in my patrol car, and I know they have a significant other they need to have the talk you know if I'm, i'll call you if i can you'll you have to be happy with that if i get to call you i get to call you if not don't worry about it unless somebody with a gold badge and the state police is coming walking up to the door so that's a bad sign that's mm-hmm. usually our lieutenant or a chaplain and all my wives knew that that was a bad thing mm-hmm. and so yeah to be a spouse i i can't even imagine how it's got to be so difficult all the time and i i can tell you at least three times where I've had to call home and tell my wife you need to get a garbage bag some wet ones and a bucket of water because I'm coming home bloody and Mm -hmm. you know I get in the garage and I strip down and throw my uniform in a garbage bag and she helps me get another uniform and cleaned up and back on the road that's got to be hard on a spouse too right absolutely Rick what should we be teaching our young people about law enforcement and respect I think that The way society is right now and what's going on in society and some people are worried about getting shot by the police is, and people might not like this, if you don't want to have any encounters with the police, don't break the law. Amen. Amen. Stay out of trouble. It seems pretty simple. Second of all, you might not know what we think we might know. We might have a description of your vehicle or a vehicle like yours that just committed a murder or just had something happen, just go ahead and listen to our direction, do what we're asking you to do. And if it's appropriate, there's there's ways to take action on that. There's internal affairs departments, there's the courts. Um, so yeah, abide by the law. Don't be afraid to come up and talk to us. If we're not busy doing something, we love to talk to people and we don't have any problem with that. But if we're on a traffic stop or you can see we're doing something, please don't try to interrupt us right away. And do what we're taught. Treat people the way you want to be treated. That's how I do it. If Sometimes I arrest people and they're okay with it and we go to jail. Sometimes they're not and we have to fight and we argue all the way to the jail and I'm human. But right. if you just treat us like we're humans and not flip us off on the road just because we're a police officer and you don't even know who I am, exactly. that'd go a long ways. You're a person too? Yeah, exactly. You know, Trooper Pearson, one of the things we, we wanted to ask you, I know in, in, in years of law enforcement and traffic stops, there has to be a, a classic excuse for someone, you having to chase down someone who was driving a little bit too fast. You and I, I, I need a good excuse, so yes, please do yeah, tell yeah, us. You have a story, what works? What works? You have well, a story you can share with us? The classic excuses are always, I have to use the restroom or I'm going to see somebody in the hospital. So okay. just be mindful that we know where the bathrooms are and you just pass them, so we know that's <laughs> not true. And we're most likely going to call the hospital and maybe confirm what you're telling us if you're going way too fast. But my overall favorite excuse that got the gentleman out of a citation was about 10 years ago. Uh, a gentleman pulled out in front of me. I, I literally had to hit the brakes. He, I, 
I don't know why he was at the time. I kind of thought maybe there was some crime afoot, and he immediately took off up to about 70, 75 miles an hour in a 55 zone. So In front of a state trooper. Right, right in front of me. And so I immediately, you know, hit my lights, and I walked up to him, and I asked him if everything was okay and if there was an emergency. And he said, well, yes, uh, trooper, I'm going to see my girlfriend, and I've already taken my pill. <laughs> <clears throat> So I didn't know what to say at first, so I finally just told him if it's the best excuse I ever heard, have a safe day. Outrageous. That is so fabulous. It, it's a true story because you couldn't make it up. Exactly. Yeah, Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. So at the CTC, we have the public safety program, so we've got a lot of uh, future law enforcement, firefighters, you know, natural resources officers, mm -hmm. first responders, lots of, lots of kids who are looking – to go into that career field your advice for them to make sure you're doing healthy choices by working out eating the right foods and learning the skills there's a lot more to it than when i got into it like i said we used to throw a shotgun in the back seat and take off there's so many different laws that you know you, you got to be starting to get prepared now to get to where you want to be if you want to be a state trooper you got to get through a lot of obstacles and a lot of other people. I mean, I had, uh, I think, two seats down for me, a doctor in my recruit school. She just decided that's not what she wanted to do anymore. I had an engineer in my recruit school. We had people from all walks of life. So if you want to be a trooper, you're going to have to be competing against other people. and you got to be prepared. So I would say at that age, get good grades. Um, and then probably the hardest ones, listen to your mom and dad because they love you and they probably are giving you good advice. Yeah. And that's really interesting <laughs> because <laughs> mo most 16 and 17-year-olds think that moms and dads are full of you know what. Right. I'm telling you, my 24-year-old calls me now for advice and I'm like, huh, I knew a thing or two. Where was, where was that six years ago? Right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you've had an incredible career and you've stayed healthy. Can you tell us how you did it? Uh, yes, I, every morning. I work almost my whole career from 2 in the afternoon to midnight. It's okay. just I prefer that shift. It seemed there's a lot more hustle and a lot more calls, so it made the day go by faster. But then it gave me the mornings where I could work out and concentrate on my eating. Um, and, you know, I, I kept close to my family, my mom. And, yeah. you know, when you have a problem, you got to talk about it. That's right. And I'm not ashamed of it anymore. I used to be, but I'm not. So the mental health goes right along with the physical health, for sure. And and you just lost your mom, and so yeah. we want to give you our condolences well, on you. that. Absolutely. Are you all friends, all the troopers? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's that thin blue line that people don't understand. They think it's a thin blue line, like we're getting something over on somebody. But when you're in a fight with somebody and that other trooper comes over and helps you, um, you know, I train all the troopers. We don't fight fair. We can't fight fair. It's not, if there's two or three of us and we're going to arrest you, we're all going to take you down and arrest you and try not to hurt you. You know, if it's just me on you, there's more likelihood that I'm going to hurt you because I'm going home at night. So that's kind of the thin blue line that I've seen through my career, that that's your best friend. You know, mm -hmm. we, our families are second to your families because right. we're going to work every day. And, um, I, I think that needs to be more recognized by people that that's the thin blue line. It's not, I'm trying, you know, if my partner, if I see my partner stealing a candy bar, they're going to jail. I mean, there's, there they are. That's mm -hmm. just, it's not going to, I'm not going to overlook that. No. And that just is never, I've never seen that happen in my career. I can see that it does happen in some places, but I've been fortunate enough. I have not had to deal with that. I've not seen it. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes right along with people respect me and know that that was going to be the outcome if sure. I caught them doing something wrong, and I would expect them to do the same thing to me. So that's kind of the thin blue line that we expect each other to hold each other up and be family with each other. And it's not really us trying to get one over on people or trying to get ahead or trying to commit crimes and you know hide it. I, I think the public expects more from law enforcement than from an average citizen. Oh, by far. I when. Um, I had stepdaughters, and I told them immediately, we live in a glass house now. Everything that you do is right. going to come back to me, yep. and vice versa. And I said, everybody knows where I live. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows who I am in the community, so this is the way it is. Yeah, you're going to toe the line. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you've earned this, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> What's the first thing that you're going to do? Day one of retirement, what are you going to do? You're going to go golfing? 
uh, you know what? I'm gonna clean out the gutters. To be honest with you, I've been looking at my gutters for a month and a half, and I said that's the first thing I'm gonna do when I retire. Okay, so how Fred, silly sick, that is. Sick of walking in the house and having it leak on you, probably. Can't someone yeah, do, just can't you can't someone do that for you as a retirement yeah. preference so that you can just you know watch TV or go for a walk with your wife or yeah. I think maybe doing all those normal everyday household tasks gives you a sense of normalcy. I think so too. Yeah. What are you gonna do the first time? You're in a situation and you see someone breaking the law and you no longer have a badge. I want to hear what you're going to do. If it's a felony, then I'm going to call 911 if appropriate or maybe step in Mm -hmm. to misdemeanor. I'm going to be a good witness, just like we do now. Wow. So even though, even if you're not a state trooper or a law enforcement officer, you can be an excellent witness and, you know, document somebody's license plate, their description. We need all the help we can get from the citizens. That's for sure. I, I do. I've got a question for you. So, cop shows. You watch cop shows? No. You never watch cop shows on TV? Because my wife of, does, but so... so and, and that's because they are not realistic to you? Because my question was going to be, what's the most realistic cop show you've ever watched? But now that is a, that, that, that is a moot question, based on what yeah, you just said. I'd say cops okay. is pretty realistic. Alaska, Alaska State Troopers is pretty realistic. But I do this every day, so I don't want to watch it either. Yeah, that, exactly. that makes sense. I just, you know, I have an exciting had an exciting life an exciting job i mean i had friends that were always on me about you don't go out and do this enough you don't go out and do this i'm like have you ever walked into a maximum security prison and had all the inmates go hey you better shut up the state troopers are here i mean that's pretty fun you know we get to drive fast sometimes (laughs) it's pretty fun bad boys bad boys exactly yeah i love it you know it, it's so wonderful to see someone when they retire still have so much life left to live and that's what you've got and so your journey's been incredible and just to hear about going state to state and helping people after you've had a lifetime of helping people that's inspiring to us rick well makes you feel good to help people and so. he's uh, and he's a year younger than i am and i'm gonna retire i have no idea when i'm gonna retire i know but i don't have that much of a stressful job either well, uh, jobs are my yeah. goodness well, uh, yeah 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 <laughs> Well, if you would please thank your wife also for her service yes, at, in dispatch. And um, just hats off to you. And we are believers in the thin blue line, aren't we, Rich? We are. Trooper Rick Pearson, congratulations on your retirement and thanks for being our guest today. Thank you both. I really appreciate it. Cadillac Unscripted is sponsored by Independent Bank on 1079 CDY. And we'll be back next week, same time, same station, with more local chat. 1079 CDY.